this is a good topic. When is it too much uh, to be DJing and drinking? It's a little thing snippet I saw uh, from an interview with uh, Louisa and a girl called Monkey who I wasn't really familiar with. I think Monkey signed to Defective Records. She's obviously she's um also a, f- a professional footballer women's footballer which is fucking nuts she plays football and she djs to a high level again i'm not sure why i think i mentioned before haven't i previously right that um this whole uh 50 50 split on venues and the festivals between male and female is a bit stupid and arcane because essentially the problem isn't that women are represented on lineups the problem is that it's the same kind of guys representing the lineups right it's not everyone's suffering even dudes we all suffer because it's the same type of guys the same names that are built for the same festivals you know year in year out or same stages the same clubs because most of the time promoters don't want to take a chance don't want to take a risk don't want to take a hit on the door or on the bar they want to make sure they get guaranteed money in through the deals because most metropolitan cities you know the the closing times are getting sure and sure and sure there's not enough time for them to make money i get it but in general the issue isn't just females it's in general right there's not enough djs outside of the top 50 that are getting represented on lineups so with that being said um i was saying earlier that i think what's weird is that even though there's been a, a concerted effort from the scene to push a certain crop of female djs it still feels like to me that they're repeating the same issues that happen in the male dj circles right where essentially the top five percent of djs female djs that have been pushed to the forefront the peggy goose the black madonna's the charlotte the, the charlotte the wits the Emma Millie Lenz, the Nina Kravitz, whoever, you know, even though they've all got, you know, years of experience, they're the ones that are really being pushed to the forefront and maybe a few others. Um, the issue is that it's just repeating the same circle, the cycle that happened before, right? With the Richie Hortons, the Lucianos, the Seth Chocolates, well, kind of, it's just repeating the same sort of process. And then what ends up happening is that there's other girls or other people in general that should be getting props that aren't really getting props because they're not the flavor of the month. They're not trendy. I don't know, whatever it is. That's, that's a shame. So that being said, I stumbled upon this DJ called Louisa, who's insanely good, right? She signed, I think, to Brodinsky Records. She's got her own um, label, too, called Ra or something along those lines. She plays Electro. It's insane. You know, I, I was a big fan of Electro back in the day. You know, um, Ed Banger Records, you know, that, that whole period of time was insane. Seeing Busy P, Busy P play, play one of his first sort of like DJ sets in the UK at Non New Arts Club was, was an experience I would never forget. Bumping into MIA, MIA there, great experience. But again, great DJ, but, you know, maybe someone that isn't maybe in a cultural zeitgeist at the moment. And even putting her to one side, Monkey, that DJ, right, who, who I just only find out about today, she's a female DJ of, you know, of high regard, signed to Defective Records, so a pro, got touring DJ. And she also plays professional football, right? I think she plays for QPR or some shit like that. It's insane, right? That's a story that you'd probably want to see promoted and spoken about more often, right? Like this girl that, that has two careers, like, at a high level, two real one percent careers like i don't know you know the amount of girls out there playing football is high right the amount of girls playing professional football is low right they're both really hard protect professionals to kind of get to the top of, and it, you don't hear anything about them um which is a shame but anyway this little clip between both of these girls kind of speaking about you know the general struggles that come with being a dj and also having and being involved in the hedonistic lifestyle that you know you're kind of attached with when it comes to being in the nightclub and how you can kind of balance the two it's a really cool little video i'm going to play it now for you guys and then kind of speak about it on the other side where is it here there we go boom the sound is up let's see what they got to talk about there we go bang <laughs> areas of the music industry, especially rock, have um, awareness around addiction and recovery in a way that dance music totally doesn't, yep. which is bizarre considering that like we talk about hedonism here and like a lot of people are partying constantly. And for some people that is awesome and it works really well and it's super fun. And for some <laughs> people it becomes a monster. It's probably one of the only Which is interesting, right? Because um I, that's very true. I also get the impression that some people are kind of, a, it's weird, right? Because nightlife culture or, you know, the electronic scene in general, we're all very aware that it's very hedonistic. It's very prone to, you know, overindulgence in alcohol and drugs, right? This is something that we all can't escape. We know that's a fact. But I also get the feeling sometimes that some people are ashamed of admitting this f- fact, right? It's a, it's kind of whispered that people are taking drugs or people are drinking a bit too much or might have a problem with drinking or are going out too much and it's ruined their career. It's all kind of hush hush. Don't really hear stuff being spoken about in the open. Um, which is the complete opposite to rock, which um Louisa mentioned, because you only have to read um whose book I've got here? Steven Tyler's book from Aerosmith. I have oh who's the other guy? I have 
Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, um, and also Keith Richards' book Life. Right, you have to read those two autobiographies from two you know rock and roll legends to know that you know it's part and parcel to admit, like especially now since Steven Tyler and and, and um, Keith Richards are you know are probably what on the other side of sixty. So they've lived enough of a life to kind of admit, and even if you see Stephen Tyler when he was on Joe Rogan podcast, right? He could sit down and reflect and say, "Yeah, I did tons of gear back in the day. I drank a lot. I smashed all the ladies and stuff. But now I'm at a point in my career where I could kind of look back and think, fuck, how did how the hell did how did I survive that?' Right? But it's a kind of cautionary tale to loads of artists coming up. So what you have now is a whole generation of rock and roll stars or indie guys who are looking at those guys as an example and thinking, you know what? How am I going to start my journey? Am I going to indulge and just see what that kind of lifestyle tastes like? Or am I going to say, you know what? I'm going to stay off it because I've already got two good examples of people saying, look, all my friends died, but I was lucky to survive, right? Because Keith Richards and Steve Tyler aren't saying they're special. They're saying that they were lucky to survive. But I think that honesty and that admission up front really helps a whole generation of artists out there who are coming up because they get to see, okay, cool. That's the bad side of things, right? But in electronic music, we don't really get that. It's all kind of hushy-hushy and everyone tries to pretend like it's not happening when it obviously is happening, um, which then leads to people coming into the scene quite naive and a bit, you know, um, googly-eyed and thinking, you know, this is what everyone does when it's not necessarily everyone does, especially when you get down to the core of it and you start really looking at people's social feed and you start to really analyze the interviews or read between lines a lot of the highest performing djs most of them you have to look at someone like a, a james a seth truckster for example i'll keep mentioning he was very open about you know the deterioration of his first relationship i think he was engaged to a girl prior when he was really popping and that kind of relationship deteriorating was in large part due to his um star or his stock in electronic scene rising right which meant he was touring more uh, which meant he was overindulging more in alcohol and drugs, whatever it may be, and his relationship deteriorated, right? To a point where they had they kind of had to break up, and he's you know he's in a whole different space. But he's very upfront about it. He was probably the only one that was kind of upfront about, hey, you probably don't want to go as fast as I did, or you don't want to you don't want to blow up and become the darling of the scene because essentially the scene's gonna chew out, spit you back out again, right? You have to see a Vici to see that story, right? Somebody who was kind of lauded as this kind of you know um, mercurial talent who was kind of basically ground into the uh, grinded into the ground by his management team, right? Into a point where he excessive, you know, he got to a point of excess where he's dying at the age of 26, 27 due to, you know, alcohol poisoning, which is insane, right? Or liver failure, whatever it may be, due to alcohol um, abuse. Um, again, I wish there was more of open conversation about it. I think in certain scenes it isn't open. I think in Germany and Berlin it definitely is. I've definitely seen a lot of um, drug awareness advisors in nightclubs talking to people who are going on bad trips or just in general advising people to kind of like take it easy. I've seen a lot of kind of you know, in general, like I mentioned it previously, loads of times to friends who have been in Berlin or Bergheim, especially who've tried to take drugs on the dance floor and they've been told, no, go to the toilet, take your time, relax. This is a safe space. Don't ruin it for everybody. I've just seen, you know, I don't know. I, there, there's not much as a mix of it overall. There needs to be more of a conversation about what, you know, what that kind of lifestyle is and what it takes to. And I guess, and I've been, like I mentioned previously, most of the top guys and girls out there aren't doing anything, right? Because especially when they're playing that you can't balance both things. I think most people know, like you've, most people have played tipsy, most people have played high and you can tell the difference between coming in sober and coming in high. It's night and day. You can't perform at your best intoxicated or under the influence of anything. It's not going to get you that far. But again, that needs to be said in public. Like, hey, I've done it for a long time in my career, but now I'm at this point in my career, I can't do it anymore. There needs to be more of that being said, but no one really does. Anyway, let's continue to hear what Monkey has to say. Films in the world where you're sort of expected to be at least or like to have a party with promoters or whatever and when you turn up and you're like no no it's okay i'll just have a bottle of water you can all particularly oh, damn. the biggest to find the right so the main thing oh, i lost it what she say? it's actually what's happening to me a bottle of water you can almost see like the disappointment on people's faces <laughs> what really like you're not coming to rave it's like yeah i'm coming to rave just like and that's the balance that i'm trying to make at the moment i think I've, I've reached a point where especially you know i'm djing every weekend friday saturday this friday at tap east next friday at tap east saturday at free compasses and again and again and again and again the good thing about it is that i don't go out as much right because i'm djing so much essentially my dj um gigs have now kind of replaced my going out because i get the you know, I've mentioned it previously. I love going out. I love hanging around with strangers, getting drunk, having a good time, dancing. I love that vibe. So obviously DJing naturally fit my kind of overall interest, just hanging out with people in general in nighttime. But I kind of get my hit of hanging out with people just by DJing, by playing their songs or 
playing something they like, playing something they don't like, hearing their requests, just generally, you know, interacting with people on the dance floor, I get that hit. So I don't need to go out again and get it again. Cool. But the problem of it is that sometimes in order to kind of get that kind of um, awkwardness off me and to kind of feel relaxed in the environment I'm in, I need to have a drink, right? I can't, I've tried to do it sober for a month. I did, I think I DJed for the entirety of Sober October for one month, not touching anything. And I fucking hate it, right? Going into a nightclub, especially into a bar. I, most of you guys will know if, you, if you're sober, going to hang out with your, with your mates that drink is the worst, right? Imagine going behind the DJ booth and playing songs for people and people wanting to talk to you or invading your personal space, whatever. It's just not the best combination. So I find it very difficult to go into a nightclub completely sober. I need something to take off the edge and kind of make me a bit relaxed and loose and not be so, you know, self-aware of what's going on around me. But there's a real balance again to it because I've noticed that the times that I've been completely sober, I've played amazing, but I've had to go through a real difficult half an hour, 45 minutes where I'm kind of struggling and I feel clunky. I feel like I'm playing bullshit. Then I hit my stride. But sometimes that little, you know, the little shot, the little kind of, you know, um, the little um, little bit of liquor here and there, maybe a little bit of whiskey, a beer or something, just to kind of get the sheen off really does help to kind of settle the nerves and get you down. But the idea that you're going to go behind a booth and rave and dance and dr- be drunk or whatever and play a good set is null and void. That isn't going to happen. It's definitely, gonna, it's definitely not going to be the way you think it's going to be. So I think that whole sort of stigma of like everyone has to be like on it or drinking or whatever. Like, dude, if we did that like three times a week, it's, it's hard. Like people can't do that. You can't, stay, you can't stay healthy like physically and mentally. Exactly. Well, some people can, but I definitely can't. So I think that whole stigma needs to be like lowered or at least at least dropped. So I think so can... And I found that myself too. I think that's a really good point they both made there. I think the stigma for me has been lowered or dropped in general. I think nowadays there's a lot of high profile DJs who are doing that whole um, Kundalini yoga thing or going to retreats, going to ayahuasca retreats, going to just like um, isolation retreats uh, where you don't have any electronics or whatever. You just kind of meditate for a period of days. There's, there's a few of them now set up, I think, in Bali too. A few people from the scene have moved out there and set up kind of camps and retreats that DJs go to have a bit of reset. Because I can imagine on my tiny amateur novice scale DJing in local bars and pubs it gets stressful right balancing that with a nine to five it gets a bit stressful I'm essentially working Monday to Friday nine to five then on Fridays I come home change wash shower go and play from 7 to 11 on Saturday go and play again from nine to it it can get a bit you know a bit much over time so I can only imagine what it must be like for a touring DJ right like she mentioned you're playing three times a week three to five times a week right in different cities around the world because they're different because they're playing professional so they're not even just playing in the same city they're traveling to places in Europe, America, Asia. Again, again, playing, playing, playing. Or I mean, playing, playing, playing. So imagine adding on top of that the idea of alcohol and stuff, right? Already, you know, depletes you, makes you tired, lethargic, whatever it may be. It's not necessarily conducive to a healthy lifestyle. But what I found really helps, especially nowadays, is that I've kind of limited or kind of deleted the idea of drinking Monday to Friday, right? I don't drink at all Monday to Friday unless I'm playing on a Friday. So it might be Sunday to Thursday to make that a week, right? I deleted. I don't have any drinks at home. I only have drinks when I go out. So if I'm going out to a place, that's why I'm going to have a bit of alcohol. If I'm DJing, I might have a drink there, but nothing in my house to kind of tempt me. And then I also have a regimen of always doing a workout in the morning. I'll try doing it in the evening a couple of times, but it gave me an excuse to get a bit drunk some previous days. So what I do now is that I always have to work out first thing in the morning. Well, every time I wake up in the morning, especially before work, I have to. It, not at the moment, I'm trying to. I'm basically. I'm navigating between waking up between five and seven in the morning. So anytime between those three hours, I have to go and exercise. Whether it's going for a run or going to the gym, I have to do some exercise. Because what that does is that it inevitably, you know, wakes you up, makes you a bit tired throughout the day. And then essentially it gives you a buffer against any kind of distraction when it comes to booze or anything, right? You're not necessarily going to fuck yourself up if you just, you know, got yourself up out of bed at six in the morning to go for a run to for 40 minutes. It doesn't make sense to go and then waste it all by drinking, right? So it kind of gives you a bit of a balance. And then what happens is that the next day, it kind of sets up the next day again because, you know, you have something to look forward to. So when I'm going DJing now and I have a run I'm doing Saturday morning, I can't go hard on a Friday because I want to wake up and go for my run the first thing in the morning. So it kind of, again, gives you that kind of buffer. I think those kind of things, in my, in my, for me, in my experience, having those kind of bookends really helps to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow. But again, I think nowadays with the new generation of artists coming up, I think it's some conversation that needs to be said 
uh, quite widely and often, especially, you know, with this initiative to get more girls involved or whatever it may be. Some girls are going to come into it, you know, with not much, that much experience, quite young, naive. So, so loads of guys too. They really need these kind of elder statesmen or elder stateswomen to really kind of be honest and say, hey, I was also a fuckhead. I was getting on it way too much. And this is what happened. This is the opportunities I lost, blah, blah, blah. blah. But don't repeat my same mistakes because we don't want it to get to a point where, you know, we have many other episodes of, you know, whatever happened to Jack Master happening to other people too because that's just an, that's an example of just excess, right? Somebody just being too excessive, going over the top and then finally catching up to them. Hopefully it doesn't happen again, 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 again. But, you know, people maybe have to live through these experiences instead of being maybe told. I don't know. 